Gaming on Windows XP has been getting the attention of retro computing enthusiasts, but not everyone wants to commit to a full desktop in order to get that experience. Let's take a look at a common laptop from the early 2000s that might be a decent way to scratch that itch. I picked up a Dell Inspiron 5150 as it was a model I remember seeing a lot when it was new but never got to actually use. It was released in late 2003, at a time when laptops were becoming not just increasingly affordable, but also viable as replacements for desktops. This was also during a time when the computer industry was transitioning from legacy interfaces like PS2 and parallel ports to USB, so the backside of this machine looks relatively sparse. Overall, this 5150 is in very good cosmetic shape, with just a bit of normal wear in spots. It included its original battery, a lithium-ion pack rated for 96 watt-hours, though it's very likely this one no longer holds as much of a charge. Under a panel to the side is a mini PCI slot. Normally this would hold a Wi-Fi card, but it doesn't look like this machine ever had one installed. That's not exactly surprising since Wi-Fi was still relatively new and gaining adoption at the time. I also wanted to see how much RAM was in the computer. There was only one module installed, a 256 megabyte DDR SO DIMM. That was also a normal amount to see and Windows XP would have run okay with it, but I found another 256 meg module in my parts bin to help give a bit more headroom. Another thing I decided to check out was the CPU fan to see if it needed any cleaning. It's reasonably easy to access on this model. The plastic strip at the base of the screen just unclips to expose a few screws holding in the keyboard. Once those were out, I could flip the keyboard onto the palm rest and disconnect its flat flex cable. One last screw holds on a metal shield, then that could be lifted away. The fan looked reasonably clean, so I was in good shape there, but this also revealed another interesting feature of this model. It has discrete graphics in the form of a daughter card. These use an AGP interface, but the connector is proprietary. There really wasn't a standard for modular laptop graphics cards at the time. This could be one of a few models offered with the 5150, so I was eager to put the laptop back together and find out which one it was. The machine booted and I was able to get into the BIOS setup. And it looks like I lucked out. This is one of the top spec configurations for the 5150 with a 3 GHz CPU, GeForce FX 5200 graphics with 64 megabytes of video RAM, and an 80 gig hard drive. The time and date were wrong, which suggests a dead backup battery but Dell annoyingly soldered it to the bottom of the motherboard in a spot that requires completely disassembling the machine. I don't care if the clock is wrong, so I'll save that work for another day. The hard drive had been wiped, so I booted from a CD to install Windows XP. That's what shipped with this machine originally, and the process went without a hitch. Once at the desktop, I did find that there were some drivers to install, but this was also quite easy. Dell is one of those companies that still keeps legacy drivers on its website, and XP offered excellent USB support out of the box, so I could copy them over using a flash drive. After a reboot, I was able to take advantage of another optional upgrade the 5150 offered. Its 15-inch LCD supports a resolution of 1400 by 1050 pixels, also called Super XGA+. This makes for quite a bit of working space, but comes with its own drawbacks, as we'll see shortly. While there were plenty of games written for Windows XP by 2003, lots of people were still enjoying titles from the Windows 98 era, so I wanted to see how Quake 3 stacked up with this GPU. I bumped up the resolution and quality settings, then ran a demo. 
and it performed very well, pushing almost 100 frames per second. Clearly, this could be a great option for games of a similar age. You may be thinking that's great, but can it run Crisis? Let's find out. I got it installed no problem, but when I went to run it, I got an ominous warning that the GPU wasn't supported. I tried anyway, and it crashed immediately. That's a pretty clear answer if I've ever seen one. So how about a synthetic benchmark instead? 3D Mark 03 was a popular tool for this at the time, so I set it to use the display's native resolution, then kicked off a run. At first, it wasn't looking too bad, with pretty decent frame rates, but as the test progressed, things got ugly quick. It was barely able to pull single digits, and the resulting score was a disappointing 781. And that's the drawback to the higher res screen option. If you run it at anything other than its native resolution, the image gets interpolated and looks soft. But it's clear that this many pixels are a major challenge for the GPU. I reran 3D Mark at its default settings and got a new score of 1227. That's a lot better, and it's in line with these benchmark results from Notebook Check. It also shows a solid performance increase over the other GPU offered in the 5150, ATI's Mobile Radeon 9000. CPU performance in this machine was equally good due to its use of a mobile Pentium 4 processor. Intel's CPU offerings during this time were confusing at best. There was a period where the company sold six different CPU lines for laptops, and they all had their own trade-offs. The Pentium 4M was easy on battery life, but performance suffered accordingly. Some laptop makers, including Dell, decided to go with desktop Pentium 4 chips for this reason. The 5150's predecessor, the 5100, was one such example, and its battery life shows the drawback to this approach. The 5150 offered over an hour more runtime, while posting even better performance figures. That's thanks to its mobile Pentium 4 processor, which sought to split the difference between the desktop P4 and P4M versions. The speed of the former, but with the power-saving features, like speed step, of the latter. That meant, in many ways, the 5150 was a solid desktop replacement. Mine came with an optical drive that can read DVDs and burn CDs, and in addition to the two USB 2.0 ports on the back, there's a 4-pin FireWire interface for connecting something like a digital camcorder. 10100 Ethernet was built in, along with a 56K modem and single PC card slot for expansion. Its keyboard is surprisingly decent. Not the best I've ever used on a laptop, but it's still reasonably sturdy. The biggest downside of the machine was really just its weight. Clocking in at about 8 pounds, or a bit over 3.5 kilograms, you wouldn't want to carry it everywhere, especially once you factored in the size of its beefy 130-watt power adapter. The other consideration, of course, was cost, and for the 5150, it could vary quite a bit depending on the configuration. High-end models could go for well over $2,000 US, and by 2004, a machine with similar specs to mine was advertised at about $1,600. Dell allowed you to custom build exactly the config you wanted on its website, and it would have been a lot of fun to explore all the options, but sadly, the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine wasn't able to capture that page. But does this machine make sense for a retro computing enthusiast? I think it really depends on what you're after. Clearly, it can't play the most demanding games from the XP era, and laptops were generally always a bit behind when it came to performance. Couple that with the limited expansion and upgrade options, and a desktop system makes the most sense. That said, not everyone wants to play the most demanding games, or perhaps you're mostly interested in titles from the late 90s, yet want the convenience and stability of Windows XP. If this applies to you, and you're looking for a retro computer that won't take up much space, well... Dude, you're getting a Dell. 